Thanks very much. Yep, I'm from the Research Centre of Ecosystem Resilience at the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people and paying my respects to the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of the lands where we're gathered today and of where I work at the Botanic Gardens of Sydney. I also wanted to begin by acknowledging the many collaborators on the two different projects that I'll talk about today. So um, many wonderful colleagues from the Royal Botanic Gardens have uh, contributed to this work as well as Rich Edwards and Colin Ahrens from the University of New South Wales, um, from the Australian National University, uh, Justin, Ashley and Chloe, um, uh, Craig Steen, Threatened Species Officer with uh, DPIE for the Rhodomotus, uh, uh, the Rhodamnia work that I'll talk about, and um, in particular, uh, Karanjit Sandhu from the University of uh, Sydney PBI, uh, who's been collaborating with us on assays of resistance. So a, a point that's been well made already um, is in the proceedings is that uh, we can think of uh, species in Myrtaceae as being arrayed along a spectrum of from being uh, almost entirely susceptible to myrtle rust to being quite highly resistant to myrtle rust. I'll just talk about two little um, studies, one of a species that's on the highly susceptible end and that is critically endangered and another that uh, shows variable levels of resistance and in, in, in that respect is an interesting model for studying metal rust. So first, uh, I'm gonna talk about a study um, and a project on Rhodamnia rubescens, which is one of several species that's already listed, at least in New South Wales, as critically endangered due to the impacts of metal rust. It's on a rapid decline towards extinction. So um, in collaboration with uh, DPE, the Saving Our Species program, and many other collaborators from um, Botanic Gardens of Sydney, um, th there's been uh, an, an initiative to collect Rhodamnia rubescens uh, across its range and to uh, grow it in ex situ circumstances, always with the, the, the long-term goal of transloc translocating them back out into natural environments. And so in aggregate, what that process might look like is um, uh, collections are undertaken and we've been really excited to genotype individuals being brought into those collections. It's assembled into a, um, a germplasm collection in a nursery such as the one at the Australian Botanic Gardens, Mount Annan or Bordery Botanic Gardens. Then um, almost inevitably there'll be um, necessarily some kind of program of amplification or breeding to try to introduce uh, greater levels of um, rust resistance before translocation back out into natural environments. Um, Stephanie Chen has already um, uh, just given a tremendous uh, presentation on this work, so I'll just touch on this really briefly. One of the first questions to ask in relation to this is, is the ex situ collection of Rhodamnia rubescens in the um, or, or that is currently held representative of diversity across the range. And so the, the, um, you can see a map of collections in New South Wales on the right and on the left a plot, a PCA plot, um, summarising the genetic variation across the samples. Each data point is an individual plant that was sampled. Um, all you really need to know about this plot is that dots closer together are more genetically similar. The good news here is that the points that are in grey, which represent individuals held in the ex situ collection, are nicely interspersed among the others, suggesting that the collection is somewhat representative of genetic diversity across the range. Um, a couple of other points that um, Stephanie also um, mentioned were that this also provided an opportunity to identify clonal individuals in the collection and reduce that redundancy. Um, it also um, illustrates that the population genetics here speak to another point, which I think might turn out to be quite important, and that is um, the, the, the inbreeding coefficient was quite low. This appears to be an outcrossing species. So oftentimes we deal with the conservation genetics of species that might have been rare for quite a long time. If they were carrying very high levels of deleterious recessive load that could lead to an inbreeding depression, probably those species would have gone extinct quite a long time ago. That might not be the case here. It might be that um, well, almost inevitably, uh, some of these species that were previously widespread, locally abundant, um, and probably preferentially outcrossing are going to go through really big bottlenecks. 
and they might have some uh, deleterious recessive alleles hanging around that could lead to problems with inbreeding depression in a few generations. And so we are going to need to carefully watch this. So the next step then um, in, in the course of trying to get back out into a, a translocation into nature would be a process of um, testing for resistance over the course of generations, trying to increase the representation of resistance if any uh, resistant individuals are found through the process of breeding before translocating back out into nature. But again, just to highlight the issue of genetic diversity again, if we, if we now sort of superimpose onto this plot, so previously if we represent resistance by the black dots and we wanna increase the representation of those, but if that's quite rare, um, and we also sort of put on there a tracer of some neutral locus in the genome and a few different alternative haplotypes at that neutral locus, uh, it might be that um, if, we, if we just bring through the resistant individuals that we will massively narrow the, the genetic uh, diversity. So we do need some, some process of achieving um, recombination through breeding and the maintenance of a broad base of genetic diversity. So I'll, um, I'll start to talk now about the results of um, some assays of disease resistance, both of ex situ collections, some individuals from ex situ collections at the Australian Botanic Gardens at Mount Annan and the um, uh, Bordery Botanic Gardens. Uh, as I said, um, carried out in collaboration with um, Karan uh, Sandhu from PBI, but I should also here acknowledge Veronica Viola and Julie Percival from um, those respective uh, botanic gardens for uh, providing the plants for these assays. Um, as Stephanie pointed out previously, um, there was a level, um, there were a percentage of the individuals, maybe on the order of 30% of the individuals from the Australian Botanic Garden collection uh, did show resistance to rust. They did not become infected when exposed um, to the myrtle rust pathogen. Um, also encouragingly, um, some seedlings were uh, germinated to, to assay viability at the Australian Botanic Garden at Mount Annan, and uh, Veronica suggested maybe also assaying these for rust resistance. And so they were on the order of um, 250 of these seedlings. And so it also turned out that um, a, uh, around 127 of these uh, also appeared to be resistant to, to rust in the assays. So just to... Um, to, to pull this part a little bit more, these are still available at the Australian Botanic Gardens growing in pots. Uh, they've now been genotyped. This represents individuals from uh, 21 different uh, parental uh, accessions. Um, those, the, the parent plants uh, varied from being quite highly susceptible to quite highly resistant in the assays that were performed and different um, percentages of those of the seed lots from those uh, mother plants were quite resistant. And so I guess it's, it's quite exciting to think that these could start to make the beginnings of some kind of pre-breeding population to, to try to um, undertake a, a broader process of trying to systematically increase the level of um, resistance. So we're gonna have to manage that quite carefully in that we just got the genetic data. They've, I've only just started analyzing the genotyping data. It does look like some um, individuals were quite uh, sort of highly overrepresented in their contribution to the paternity within the, um, the open pollinated nursery, but that, that can be managed to, to try to um, uh, keep individuals in a way that balances their representation. And um, also, of course, I, I intend to start doing some more quantitative genetic analyses of these data. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, um, those seedlings are available. So it, it um, does um, raise the, the question or the opportunity of planting these out at the Australian Botanic Gardens with the objectives of challenging um, challenging the resistance when grown under field conditions and when they're not treated with um, fungicide, do they may, uh, remain resistant? Um, it also gives us some prospect of trying to maintain diversity by um, balancing what is uh, kept and imposing further selection. Um, <clears throat> it, as I mentioned, this represents some sort of a start on a pre-breeding population. Um, uh, and 
potentially can start to turn into a, a template and a workflow for breeding towards translocation in these species that are very heavily impacted. So I'll just now um, just, I, I have gone way slower than I thought I would, so I'll just talk really, really quickly about our, our work on um, broadleafed paperbarks, which as has been pointed out by um, Jeff Pegg and by um, Alyssa, uh, show highly lev uh, variable levels of resistance and from that perspective might be an excellent model species for investigating the genetic basis of resistance. Uh, it's also been shown in um, previous work by Pegg and Al that that variability appears to be heritable. So just to um, mention really, really quickly what we've been doing on this with a, a large group of collaborators from UNSW, um, I should mention Stephanie Chen and Colin Ahrens, um, particularly for their contribution to this project. Um, uh, we collected individuals of Melaleuca quinquinervia across their range in New South Wales, uh, grew up many, many seedlings. Again, these were um, uh, exposed to rust under controlled conditions by, in collaboration with Karan at PBI. And we've just uh, received uh, whole genome resequencing data for 600 of the seedlings and 180 mother trees. So we can do a GWAS type study where we look for um, genetic markers associated with resistance. This is sort of um, first from a, a basic science perspective to identify mechanisms of resistance. Secondly, if we did identify a manageable number of markers that are robustly predictable, uh, that robustly predict resistance, we could start potentially assaying seedlings for use in restoration projects and things of that nature. I'll also point out though that we also had an opportunity to plant a number of Melaleuca trees at the um, Australian Botanic Garden site at Mount Annan. So um, even before we had the genetic data, we uh, chose 900 trees to plant and we selected those to um, have an over-representation of uh, seedlings from families that had a high level of resistance to rust. And we also uh, made sure those were drawn from uh, widely distributed areas to also balance out the diversity of those plantings. So the goal there was to have plantings that in the future will um, provide elevated, more, more resistant and diverse progeny for restoration projects of this uh, terribly important um, species in swamp ecosystems. And um, that, that just sort of, this diagram just sort of illustrates how we have um, sort of truncated the frequency distribution of um, the observed levels of an index of infection of the, the seedlings in the plantings to over-represent the things that were less infected under experimental conditions. And so in conclusion, um, in, um, Rhodamnia rubescens observations of resistance begin opening pathways towards breeding and potentially recovery. In Melaleuca quinquinervia, we've um, uh, established some hopefully resistant and diverse plantings, potentially for seed production in the future. And so a couple of projects there where trees are now planted out in the ground at the Australian Botanic Gardens. Again, I just want to acknowledge all of the many collaborators in this work and thank you for your attention. Thanks, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, because some um, Mutaceae show, tend to show higher susceptibility as seedlings than as older plants. How would you factor that into, um, into your work? Yeah, at the moment, um, we, we don't have really a way to factor that in. And that's why I think it's critically important that if we do the assays in seedlings, uh, well, actually, I, I guess I was more concerned about it going the other way, that we would find things that are resistant as seedlings that would turn out not to be resistant as adults and then would not be able to successfully reproduce. In some ways, it feels like that's where the, um, if we start bringing things into breeding programs, that's sort of the, the side where maybe the, the risk um, resides. But, um, but uh, I, I guess uh, ultimately there's, there's really no way to know that but to test it. Um, and, and I guess uh, ontogeny is just one of the variables there. It could also be other under different environmental conditions and, and the like. So I guess um, sort of uh, maybe doing assays on seedlings to try to reduce the numbers to a, a more manageable subset 
somewhat and then planting out things as, as much as possible to test them under field conditions and over the life cycle. Yeah, it's quite complicated, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs>